All right, everybody, let's do part two of earthquakes. A whole lot of shaking going on. Uh, get out your King James Bible, turn to the book of Exodus. We're going to read chapter 19. Remember something. The Old Testament is the foreshadow of the New Testament, and the New Testament symbolisms are given light to explain what they are from the Old Testament. And I will demonstrate that in a little bit. Now, Los Angeles just had a uh, seven on the Richter scale earthquake. That's getting up there. Uh, Los Angeles is the second largest city in the United States. It is the movie and porn capital of the United States. And uh, California is probably the gay headquarters, San Francisco, um, of the United States. So, you know, it's, um, what can I tell you? So maybe the Lord's trying to send a message? Possibly. I think so. All right, Exodus 19 and... Verse 1, Moses is uh, getting ready to go up on the mount, okay? So in the third month when the children, sorry, I had to get some water there. Verse 1, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so... Uh, this is the um, after the first Passover, the children of Israel left slavery in Egypt, and they're going out into the desert. So, of Sinai, S I N, S I N, Sin, A I. Huh? Artificial intelligence, right? Sin A I. No, it's Sinai, right? Verse two. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. All right, did, it, did you see that? And how I bear you on eagles' wings. Now, eagles' wings, how the Lord brought them out of Egypt. He says, "He how I bear you on eagles' wings. I mean, it's a figure of speech. I mean, there wasn't this huge giant eagle that was, you know, had a 50-foot wingspan. I'm sorry, a 50-mile wingspan. And all the Israelites got on the eagle's back and it flew away. No. You know, it's it's a figure of speech. Uh, just like uh, a guy sees an attractive-looking woman and says, Wow, she's a fox. No, he's not commenting on her four legs and her uh, tail. Uh, well, her, you know, a canine. I guess foxes are some type of canine, right? It's a figure of speech. Now, these eagle's wings, guess what? We're going to read about that again in Revelation chapter 12. That's why I'm dwelling on this. It says, how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself because the bible in revelation 12 talks about how the lord took the woman in the wilderness his church and how he uh on eagle's wings so just like there was an exodus out of egypt there is going to be an exodus of god's people out of babylon so keep that in mind about the uh Eagle's wings. Keep that in mind. Figure of speech. Verse 5. Now, therefore, if, if, 
ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So they had to obey and keep the covenant, which they didn't. Didn't happen, people. If you don't believe me, read Jeremiah verse th chapter 3 and verse 8. They did not keep the covenant. Verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Oh, never mind. That's the Bob translation. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And that was symbolic. You know, you think about it. Let them wash their clothes. Uh, well, what happens at the marriage supper of the Lamb? You're given white wedding garments, right? We're getting a new clothes washed in the blood, right? Oh, uh, in Revelation chapter 7, 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, yeah. All right, so. Exodus 19.10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Why the third day? Wasn't Jesus raised from the dead on the third day? Yeah. Verse 12, And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet, trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Just remember, in the tribulation... There's seven trumpets. Uh, let's see, verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. He didn't want them having uh, marital, intimate marital relations. Verse 16, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace 
and the whole mount quaked, quaked greatly. Boy, that would be a scary sight, wouldn't it? You see fire and smoke and the, the whole mountains quaking, shaking. Oh, yeah. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down from Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, and Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. All right, so the mountain quaked when Moses went up to the mount. Keep that in mind. And the eagle's wings. Don't forget that. That's going to be coming up. Might be in the third study. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll talk about it again, I'm sure. All right. Here in uh, Turn Your King James Bible to 1st uh, Kings chapter, I'm sorry, the first book of Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. I did an in-depth study of Elijah. It's about an hour and 45 minutes long. If you're interested, um, Elijah had just challenged the prophets of Baal. Some say Baal. Uh, had, just, had just challenged the prophets of Baal. They failed the challenge. He killed them all. And wicked King Ahab and his evil wife Jezebel were uh, on the warpath to, to kill Elijah. Uh, of all the Old Testament prophets, of all the prophets, I think Elijah's probably, I say my favorite, but I'm, I probably should say the most, my, what I consider the most interesting, had a very interesting ministry. So let's read. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Now, these were the prophets of the satanic ones. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods, plural, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw it, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. I wonder if that was a part of Budweiser, Beersheba. I don't know. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. Uh, you know, this is the thing. Elijah did everything he could to bring revival to Israel. And it didn't come. I look at this. This is like textbook clinical depression. I mean, yeah, I took, I took some psychology in college. You know, but this is this is depression. I mean, this is it right here. I mean, here it is. He had risked his life to try to bring revival to Israel, and it didn't happen. It wasn't his fault. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, 
Then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon, on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Boy, that must have been some meal last last you forty days and forty nights, huh? Oh, wait a minute! Didn't didn't Jesus uh, go forty days and forty nights fasting? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, Mark one and verse thirteen, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Yep, Jesus fa uh, fasted 40 days and 40 nights. All right, so yeah, there's certain numbers that pop up in the Bible over and over and over, like 7 and 12 and 40. Uh, those numbers just pop up a lot. All right, so verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. See, we read where Moses, uh, the children of Israel, said that they'd keep the covenant. But here Elijah saying, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life. To take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphath of Abel. Meloha, something like that, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. See, God was showing his power to Elijah in the fire and in the earthquake and in the wind. All right, let's go to the book of Nahum, chapter 1. Verse 1, the burden of Nineveh. Guess what? Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Jonah the whale. But this is, uh, I guess you could say this is part two. Jonah was sent to Nineveh to preach repentance. And they did. They repented. But uh, Nahum's got 
uh, let's just say it's it's not the same as what Jonah was sent, but we'll hear. Jonah, Nahum chapter 1, 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord re revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. You know why there's hurricanes and tornadoes? The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Yeah, this is going to happen. Uh, this is mentioned. Ooh, yeah. Let's uh, let's keep reading. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down. By him. Compare this with uh, the second book of Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. All right, let's go back to Nahum. Oh, uh, let's see. Verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. And what do you do with stubble fully dry? You burn it. Verse 11. There is one come out of thee that, imagine, that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, Though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. See, that's talking about our his people. They're gonna be they're gonna be have a yoke around their neck and and bonds. They're gonna be in chains basically. Verse 14, 
And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image, and the molten image I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. In the end times chapter of Matthew 24, starting in verse 5, Christ warns, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. That means divers, uh, like diverse, you know, they always tell us diversity is our strength. Uh, yeah, right. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, there's a time of sorrows before the Great Tribulation. And I think we're getting close to it. Now, in Matthew 27, verse 35, uh, the crucifixion of Christ. Okay? Verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save, if he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lamach sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. Yeah, the Jews thought he's calling for Elijah. They don't even understand the Hebrew or Aramaic that Jesus was speaking here. Because it's not the Romans, right? So, verse 48, And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Can you imagine that? Christ dies. It's dark. 
there's an earthquake, the rocks are breaking, graves open up, and and the, the saints are crawling out of their graves. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So this happened after his resurrection. Now when the centurion, when and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly this was the son of God. All right, how about three days later? Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. See, a lot of things happen with earthquakes, right? Now, Ma uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are parallel accounts of the end times. You could read about it. All right, so we read uh, about the earth, uh, the earthquake where Paul and Silas were, right? So uh, let's let's go. Uh, well, I don't know. Revelation. Let's go to the book of Revelation. All right, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 11. We're getting close. I think this is only going to be a two-parter. Revelation 11 and verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out measure not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot, Forty and two months. So that's uh, about three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. One of them, um, let's see, uh, Bob's note here. One of them is going to be Elijah. The second one is up for debate. Some people say Moses because of the transfiguration when uh Moses and Elijah and Jesus were transfigured. Other people say Enoch as the second only other person in Scripture that never died, along with Elijah. Um, so we'll see. Personally, I think the false prophet is going to claim to be Elijah. That's, that's, I'm, pretty certain of that, I, you know, but don't, uh, I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be a prophet. And uh, being I do, I, I do this uh, as a volunteer and I don't ask for money, uh, there's no profit involved. So what can I tell you? I'm not a prophet. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Uh, people, that's roughly 42 months. 1,200 
uh, 60 days. That's, you know, that's just two ways of either going by the days or 42 months. It's, it's about the same amount of time. So the two witnesses are going to be clothed in sackcloth. Verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, Elijah, uh, what he did was there were soldiers of Ahab that came to arrest him. And he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and devour thee. I'm paraphrasing. And fire came down from the heaven and they were burned up. They were gone. Matter of fact, he did it again, twice. So is their mouth a flamethrower? No, not exactly. But uh, yeah, if you're interested, hour and 45 minutes, my Elijah study, you can uh, hear about it. Verse 6, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, just like Egypt, right? And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Elijah prayed for no rain in Israel for, I think, three years. And it didn't rain. It didn't rain. So the Old Testament explains the New Testament, when you think about it. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall over come them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified huh where was the Lord crucified well if your Lord is Jesus Christ he was crucified in Jerusalem which is called the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Think about that. Verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer or allow and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Sounds like Christmas to me. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Didn't Jesus go up to heaven in a cloud after he was resurrected? Yes! Yes! Verse 13. Here's the punchline. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. And the same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the god of heaven yep people there's going to be a remnant and they're going to give glory to god because you know what when this happens it's going to scare the jesus out of them or into them I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious, but I'm just saying. Um, of course, you could say he's trying to scare the hell out of them. I, you could say that, you know. But I mean, you know, these guys have been dead for three and a half days, and then all of a sudden they stand up alive, and then they go up to heaven in a cloud, and the, and the people that are worshiping the beast are going to say, uh, we were wrong. And they're going to be affrighted, and they're going to give glory to the God of heaven. Verse 14. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel 
sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I guess we ought to just go ahead and finish this chapter up. Uh, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God and on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. God's going to destroy those that destroy the earth. 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and an earthquake, and great hail. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 16. And, uh, all right, so, I, I did, you know, I, I knew there was going to be earthquakes, but uh, I didn't know it was so much tied into the uh, the end times. See, you're not uh, you're not the only one that learns something. You know, every time you read the Bible, you're going to learn something. I know I do. All right, Revelation 16, verse one. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, "Go your ways and pour out the vials, the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth." And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. Now, there's people that are going to tell you uh, revelations all past. None of this is future. Uh, well, there's another, there's people who will tell you that Revelation's all future. And then there's people who will tell you Revelation's all past. Well, they're both wrong. Parts of Revelation were present when John was writing it. Part of it was past. And part of it is future. Well, this part we're reading now is future. Can anybody tell me when the sea became the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. When is that recorded in history? Uh, never, never, never. All right, verse four. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. See, Al Gore's right. Global warming. <laughs> How do you like that? And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, 
and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Make sure you keep your wedding garments, people. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. A great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every mountain fled away, and the mountains were not found. So when all the islands disappear and there's no more mountains because of this earthquake, then you can say, the uh, prophecy has been fulfilled. But last I heard, uh, Mount Everest is still standing in the Himalayas. So I say this is future. Verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. I believe a talent's like 70 pounds, people. Can you imagine a stone weighing 70 pounds falling on your head? And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. All right, everybody, I think I'm going to make a part three. Uh, there's uh, a lot of background I've got to do, but uh, I, I don't know. It's a lot of background for me to finish this up in I just, it's almost, well, it's three quarters of an hour. So I think it's best if I just make a part three and then finish this up. And we're going to cover the eagle's wings of Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to talk about a great earthquake that's going to be salvation to God's people. You know, the flood was the doom of the wicked, but it was salvation for uh, Noah and his family. The flood was salvation. Well, guess what? The earthquake is going to be salvation for God's people. So, all right, uh, this is the end of part two. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.